panic, anxiety, uncertainty. These are some of the words increasingly coming into use among observers of the world economy as coronavirus continues to spread unabated. In Nigeria, that fear of the unknown is even more pronounced given the parallel state of the economy even before the emergence of the outbreak in faraway China. But in a good twist of fate, Nigeria this week once again claimed the top position as Africa's biggest economy, raising the question among economy watchers as to whether it was achieved on the strength of the policies of the Buhari administration or the fact that former occupiers of the position in South Africa relapsed into recession for the third time in 30 years. For a broader conversation on all of this and other issues, we are now being joined here by Mustafa Chikeobi, the inaugural managing director and chief executive officer of Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, Amcon. Welcome to the program. Good to have you again. Good Good have you again. Thank you for well, joining us. Let, let's start with the coronavirus, which yes. is the big subject, you know, of the year. Yes. Um, Two percent mortality rate uh, globally. Um, but what does it mean for investors? What are the implications, particularly for the Nigerian economy? And what should investors do to protect themselves against higher risks and uncertainties? You know, in the face of this global crisis. Well, I I I, I heard you earlier, and um, I think that even though we can't avoid it, there's a clear overreaction to the coronavirus. Um, I was doing some research, and in the U.S. this year, so far, so far this year, 14,000 people have died from the flu, which is a much bigger number, much bigger, no matter how you slice it, than coronavirus has killed in the last, in the whole world. So the flu, the, the regular flu that we manage every year is a far deadlier killer than coronavirus has so far shown to be. I understand the caution. I understand that we don't know the extent of how bad it can get. But it doesn't seem to be the killer that everybody is trying to say it is. It's just not killing that many people, and it's not as dangerous as the flu, which we manage every year. There's a flu season in the U.S., and if you do the research, last year, the flu in the U.S., the whole of the year, was responsible for 35.5 million hospital visits and over 80,000 deaths. So on a scale, worldwide scale, the, this coronavirus, even though it's a developing situation, we should be careful about it. Um, I think that there's hysteria, and I think that all of us will do well not to be hysterical about it. Well, thank you for that perspective. I actually okay. find it very Sorry. reassuring. I was asking you about investors. So well, investors so should me... also not be hysterical? Look, investors... Yeah. Every industry is, uh, you Look, know, being shut down. Investors should not be hysterical. There's hysteria, and this happens. It happens all the time. And I think it's good to be careful to, you know, what the scope of it is until there's a, an antidote for it or a vaccine for it. Um, but I think that cautiousness and hysteria are two different things. There's hysteria, clearly. Airline industries are suffering, hotel industries are suffering, travel is almost shut down in Europe. Um, and I think that, that we just have to write this out. I think that the impact of coronavirus over the long run will be very mild, but we still have to deal with the hysteria for the next three to six months. From your lips to God's ears, I mean, I always enjoy a silver lining, you know, best possible outcome scenario, so let's hope that that's what happens. But you mentioned America and the flu, the Federal Reserve do not cut interest rates in response to flu season. They have done so for coronavirus. So it is a bit of an issue, not to you personally, but around the world there is some kind of panic. And now that we have to accept, yeah, you talked about the flu, but we had Ebola, we had SARS, and now COVID-19 is the virus du jour. We have to accept that we're always going to face these things. It's a cycle. So what do we do going forward? What does this say about globalization? Is this the end of the global economy as we know it? Are we going to follow? No, it's a, a very I, valid question. It really is. Yeah. Because if you note, politically, there's been a backlash against globalization. You've had the rise of all these far-right movements. Is there going to be a similar backlash economically, or is this just a blip? I think that when the dust clears, that the investors who are brave enough to actually buy now will be seen as heroes. I think, again, that this is, this, is, this is like economic cycles. It will happen from time to time. What we need to do is what we're doing. Be careful. Wash your hands. 
don't shake hands casually. Um, the, the pursue normal hygiene, hygiene um, um, regimen, protocols. regimens yeah. and protocols. And I think that, but in the end, making this look like, look, we, we were here in 2000 when they said the computer, the 2000 thing was going to end the global economy I as we know it. remember that. The millennium bug. The millennium bug was going to end the world as all the banks were going to crash. People were actually stuck. I remember in the years, people were actually stocking up goods because they felt that on that day that something would happen and the yeah. economy would collapse. They, we have survived the First World War, we survived the Second World War, we survived almost everything. I'll tell you a very funny story. The man who invented the machine gun, a guy called Maxim, a French man, and when he invented the machine gun, somebody made a calculation that 100 machine guns firing continuously for two weeks would wipe out the earth, would wipe out everybody on earth. And so there was this whole panic that the machine gun was going to be the end of civilization as we knew it. It's not. The atomic bomb has not been. And coronavirus will not be the end of the global, <laughs> global economy. And we will get out of this, and we'll get out of this fine. Certainly. But let's also speak about the effects that it's possibly going to have or already having here in Nigeria. In fact, already having. Now, if we go back to the 2016 recession and the main causes, we're looking at a fall in global oil prices and production. And here we are in a situation where just two days ago, the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, had come out and announced that, yes, we are possibly going to review the 2020 budget, seeing as there has now been a fall in global oil prices. So we're in a bit of a risky situation here, given our dependency on oil. To add to that now, we woke up this morning to find out that South Africa, too, has added a case or has now got their first case of coronavirus. This is now adding to the list of African countries that are getting their first cases, second, third, fourth, of coronavirus, right? So we're looking at a situation where, hey, how are we also going to go about the implementation of the Africa Free Trade Continental Area Agreement when we have all these possible shocks that are going to come to our economy given coronavirus or our economies? How well can we handle all of this? What is the real state of the Nigerian economy or what is it going to be with coronavirus? I mean, we're here with headlines talking about South Africa going into a recession and how Nigeria's economy is now the largest in Africa again. But how long can we really sit on that pedestal for? Well, the pedestal, which, which again, you put in your intro, the, being the largest economy in Africa because somebody else fell down doesn't impress me. Yeah. Um, they fell down, and so we, by default. It wasn't something we did that was great, that made us a great economy. It was South Africa. And the South African schism. If you've been to South Africa in the last 10 years, you will have seen that there's a schism there. They have not been able to integrate themselves as one country. There's still the issue of 90% of the world is in the hand of the white people, and the, the black people are resentful of the fact that in spite of all of, of, all of the political gains, the real power and the real economy sits in the hands of a very few number of whites. So those fault lines have always been there. And the fact that the South African economy was going to have difficulty was always going to happen. And I don't think we should measure ourselves with South Africa. We should measure ourselves with much bigger goals. We are not doing well. We're not doing as well as we should be doing. And we should take no comfort from the fact that South Africa is slipping. And as, as they are slipping, Egypt is rising. And we should keep an eye on Egypt. Egypt, at the rate they're going, will overtake us as the largest economy in Africa. So, again, I think we should look, keep an eye on the, on the ball. The six months from now, I guarantee you, we will not be discussing coronavirus. I guarantee you. Um, there's a notion that when the large economies have a little difficulty, they try to infect us with this. Um, the real issue is the price of oil. And again, oil is only 10% of our economy. It's not, it's a big foreign exchange earner, but it's not the big driver of our economy, as people seem to think it is. Um, again, this budgeting with an oil price benchmark, I've always been against it. Yeah. I think we should do a budget independent of an oil price benchmark um, and know what we can afford and how we're going to fund it, as opposed to this obsession with 54, 55, 56, who knows? But by the end of the year, we will be above the benchmark again. I think that this is a six-month problem. It's a serious problem. But I think we should look at the bigger issues that face our economy. And coronavirus is not one of them. OK, but it's good to also talk about the Nigerian economy. Yesterday, yes. Yes. there was a serious drama at the uh, Senate, at the National Assembly, when the Senate, after this debate, disagreement, tension, conflict, decided to now approve the uh, loan uh, 
uh, that has been requested for by President Buhari. The, now it's been cut down to $22.7 billion. Yes. Originally, the president in November 29 submitted a proposal of uh, 20, 29 .9, but they removed $6 billion out, out of it. But even at that, a yes, there was, a, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, disagreement, partisan yes. disagreement. Eventually, they passed yes. the bill. Now, what's your take on this? Because when the president first came up with that uh, proposal, uh, first with the Eighth Assembly and later with the uh, Ninth Assembly, Nigerians were divided. There are Nigerians who think, look, we don't need to take any look, whether it's, it's for infrastructure or not. What do you think? Well, my view is that po elections have consequences. I mean, you've seen in the U.S. where the, the, Dem the, the Republican Congress totally rams through everything and against the, the, the Democrats. And in, the house of us, in, their, in their house, the Democrats dominate the Republicans. So it's not unusual that in the kind of government we have, that APC will do what they want in terms of passing laws and passing bills and passing approvals in the, in the, in the Senate. So it's not surprising. And uh, by the way, he's overreacting. That's going to happen. Um, I'm not as concerned about the actual approval, because I think Nigeria will find it very, very difficult to raise that money. So the fact that the Senate has said, go ahead and borrow it, is a long way from being able to actually borrow it at a rate that makes sense. So I think... But they are looking at 25%, and they say it's a basically a concessionary... Uh, 25? 25%. Uh, who has said that? Well, that was reported. My point is that I, I, I talked to a lot of international investors. Nigeria borrowing money at this time, when, when the rating agencies are rating Nigeria economy as negative, is going to be very difficult and if possible, very expensive. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's just the well, first step. If you could hold your thoughts, let's take a short break. When we return, you will continue. Please stay with us. It's still The Morning Show here on Arise News. <music> Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Still with us in the studio is Mustafa Chikobi, uh, former chief executive officer of asset management Corporation of Nigeria. Well, we were talking about the loan that was approved yesterday yes. uh, for the Buhari administration, and you were just commenting on that. And you were saying that perhaps the PDP uh, minority leader was overreacting and that you had other concerns. Yes, I, I mean, I think that it's going to be much more difficult to get the loan in the form we're saying. You can't get a concessionary loan for the purposes that they said they want to get it for. So they have to go and borrow the money, and I think it'd be tougher than they think. Um, that doesn't give me any joy, but I think that the, the drama need not be so bitter at this point. Let's see what happens when the process actually starts. You're such a pragmatist. <laughs> but anyway, back to this whole issue, inability or difficulties in getting foreign loans, is that connected to a decline in foreign investments as well? Because back to what Dr. Abati was saying earlier about Nigeria overtaking South Africa, well, by default, as you pointed out, some people have credited the CBN's measures for boosting growth. You don't? Well, the growth is anemic by any standards. Any time your growth less than your population growth, it's, it's not good enough. Um, but again, growth is better than recession. But it's anemic. And um, my position has always been that the only thing that can cure Nigeria's economic ailment is rapid GDP growth. Rapid GDP growth will create, it, it has its own problems, but it, what it creates is it creates employment, it creates hope, it creates opportunities. And if we can grow rapidly, I am saying 10% or more for the next 10, 15 years, I think you will see that a lot of the problems we have, even the political divides we have, the crime, the insecurity, the unemployment, the most dangerous thing in any society is a large group of unemployed young men Men, not women. Men are more troublesome than women. Uh, <laughs> having a large group of unemployed young men sitting around at the barber shops, playing drafts, cooking up schemes without anything to do, look forward to, is the most dangerous thing you can deal with. It doesn't show up immediately, but it shows up over time. And when you have enough of them, it takes a long time to solve that problem. So I think we should focus on growth and employment. 
and the other things that come with it, which may be inflation, which may be a weaker currency than we middle class would like, um, I think those things we have to manage. But we cannot manage having our young men hopeless. And all they see is crime, insecurity, agitation, or traveling abroad. We can't have that. Absolutely. You know, I was so shocked the other day when our business correspondent, Rosas, came on the show, and he was showing us latest data about life expectancy that showed that out of 184 countries, Nigeria was ranked 180th, and life expectancy is now at 54 years old. I, I literally choked on my tongue. And I, I'd like to go into investment here and encouraging investors and also looking at schemes or programs that the government has put in place over time in this administration. Like take, for example, the Treasury single account that's supposed to promote a lot of transparency, digitizing the CAC, trying to improve on the ease of doing business. And yes, we have gone up in the rankings of recent, which is great news as well. But we also have a government of the day that is so quick to change on policies, and we have seen that affect investors coming into the country, and we have heard of investors also complaining about the fact that when you don't have a stable government, when you have a government that can just switch up on you and change policies that can affect your business overnight, it's not necessarily attractive for us to come in. So now we have this sort of dampened image on Nigeria or damp image on Nigeria. How, how long do you think it's really going to take for us to revamp ourselves, for us to become an economy again that is attractive to investors? How long is it going to take for us to get back to being that? Because we're really just very far from that right now. Well, um, you've put a lot of problems in one basket. Um, I was talking, I just came back from the U.S. two weeks ago, and I was talking to a very senior colleague of mine who was retired from the Federal Reserve. And he looked at me and he said, you know, your policies encourage capital exportation, not capital importation. He goes, any smart person in Nigeria will change their money to foreign, uh, to, uh, to foreign currency and export it. He says, so you guys are exporting your capital through buying foreign goods, through changing money and shipping it abroad, and your policies are not encouraging capital importation. He says, go back and if they really want capital to come to Nigeria, let them look at their policies and see whether they can encourage capital importation as opposed to encouraging capital exportation. And we're all doing it. We're all going to England for vacation. We're all buying goods abroad. That is a form of capital exportation. We're all going to China. We're going to, to China. Goods. We're sending our children to school. Suffering from China. We're, so we earn money here, and we export it by our children by paying school fees abroad. So we're, we're, we're actually... People are exporting all the capital they can, as quickly as they can today. And then as we're doing that as Nigerians, we're asking foreigners to come in and bring in their capital. And they're saying, no, 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 no. Your, your people are exporting your capital. We're not going to help you with that. So all the capital you're seeing in Nigeria is it really FDI. It's, 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 it's hot money that's earning some guaranteed, artificially guaranteed rate through Omo bills. And that's all you're seeing. It's very difficult to see a serious investor coming into Nigeria. So we have to sit down and say, what are we really after? Are we, do we really want a, um, a foreign investment or we don't? If we do, then there are things we need to do as a whole. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we must look at the appropriate level of the Nigerian currency. It is completely inappropriate where it is today. Well, you know, you've talked about overreacting to the threat of coronavirus. Yes. And you also uh, didn't panic over the uh, drop in the spot price of crude oil, yes. even with this additional cut being proposed by uh, OPEC plus, well, OPEC, not yes. plus, because Russia has not yet made up its mind. That's correct. But the Minister of Finance seems to have an opinion different from yours. The other day, she, just, she said, inevitably, in Nigeria, we have to review the 2020 budget yes. because of what is happening. Yes. Oil prices, coronavirus. Uh, do you think she is also overreacting? No, and I, if not, what kind of review would you like to see? I agree with her. So okay. I, I don't. Th I think that is a very rational attitude to have. We had this benchmark. The benchmark has changed. It looks like it's going to be changed for a while. Let's review. That's normal. That's not panicking. Panicking is what I see where you look at airports today across the Europe and airports are empty. That to me is panicking. Uh, there's been no data showing that people are catching coronavirus by, by traveling. Is that there's a few, two ships have been quarantined, maybe three ships worldwide, out of thousands of, of luxury ships. 
the numbers are clearly not demanding the kind of actions people are taking in some areas. So that's what I call a panic hysteria. But that the Minister of Finance should sit down and review her budget. Even she should review it even without this. She should review it every quarter. I believe that all our plans and policies should be reviewed regularly every quarter. And you should tell us. You know, I made a call that the Economic Advisory Council should publish the advice they give the president publicly. It shouldn't be a secret. They're a brilliant bunch of people. I'm sure what they put out is very sensible. But let us also see it so we can know one of two things. A, what are they recommending to the president? And B, is the president rejecting or accepting it? If he's accepting it, how well is he executing? So, they, they, so the people can measure what they're doing. It's in their interest and in the interest of the country that those things, that those that deliberations and their, and their recommendations are public. It's in their interest. And it's not a criticism because many of them are people I highly respect. But this secret, brief the president secretly, we don't know what they told the president, all of that doesn't, it, that doesn't create confidence. So yes, I think reviews are good. I think the thing should be open to everybody to see. And the pundits like us, we can, we can have a say, and we may be right or wrong, but at least let's know what they're recommending. So, no, the, the minister is doing the right thing, and I don't think she's panicking. And if she was panicking, I would say, don't panic. In six months, coronavirus will be something in our every mirror. I, I'm still saying this. Amen to that. We're running out of time. I wanted to ask you about the Citigroup report. It might sound like chicken little to you. The sky is falling, saying that Brent crude might drop to $47, which is... Pretty disastrous, considering we are a country that spends two-thirds of our revenue on debt servicing. What's, what's your take on that? Well, some people said it was going to go below 30. It was in the 30s and we survived. We will tighten our belts. It was $10 at the point. Yes. <laughs> we will, we will, we will in the last, this cycle, it was, at 30, it was around 30 in this cycle. Okay. Just in 2016, 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. So we will tighten our belts, and maybe we don't fly as many business class seats as we used to. But we'll get through it. But um, those predictions come all the time. And, and the, the pool, I say, was going to be at 30 forever. So it'll go to 70 something. So it may be 47 for a while. But I think that in the end, our problems are longer term than, than the drop of oil well, price. Thank you very much. And, thank I think, you. and I think we're approaching them properly. Thank you very thank much. That was a refreshing perspective. Thank, thank you. you.